Scatting is the wordless vocal jazz improvisation you've probably heard from people like Ella Fitzgerald, Scatman John, and uh, elsewhere. But chances are you've probably never heard this man, Lauren Benedict, who performs in a unique style with syllables and phonemes you won't hear from anyone else. It's not for everyone, but I love it. And I wanted to transcribe this video to see exactly what he was saying. So I did. Here it is. It's so impressive to see his harmonic inventiveness and rhythmic precision. You can even tell here, he sings a note slightly too flat and then immediately corrects it. He's clearly a great musician with a unique performance practice. That's great and all, but how do we make this more fun for us, beyond just doing a standard transcription? What if these syllables aren't just nonsense? What if there's a message hidden deep inside these syllables? Can we, for example, orchestrate this piece based on instructions secretly embedded in the text? Okay, hear me out. We're gonna talk about phonetics now. Each syllable contains three parts, a starting consonant, a vowel, and an ending. Let's start with the vowels. There are these things called formants, which are the frequencies that make up the sound of a vowel. There are entire fields of study based on the subject, but in a nutshell, the frequencies of any given vowel are actually very measurable, predictable, and replicable. Take this vowel for example. If you do some formant analysis, you get these numbers, which are the three frequencies that have the most energy in this vowel when spoken by an average adult human male. It basically means that these three frequencies are the loudest, and that's what makes a vowel sound like a vowel. To make this useful for us, we're going to ignore F3 since it tends to have the least amount of variance, and you can usually distinguish a vowel using F1 and F2 alone. Try doing this on your own. Run through a bunch of vowels while singing the same pitch and see how the sound changes to your ears. Or if you don't want to seem like a crazy person to your roommates or family, you can check out Pink Trombone, where you can simulate a human mouth and all the constituent parts used to create a sound. You can see from this chart that there's a large amount of variance in the F1 and F2 frequencies. We're going to convert them to a series of simple ratios and then round them to their nearest whole number. And this is the data that we'll use to make a comparison to musical instruments. The reason we're doing this is because we're treating our F1 as our fundamental. And by comparing our F2 to our fundamental as a ratio to 1, we're able to estimate what its strongest overtones would be if it was produced by an instrument. We're leaving out this vowel because Lauren doesn't actually use it. 
Speaking of which, instruments also have unique harmonic spectra, which is what makes a guitar sound different from a piano, even when they're playing the same pitch. A large amount of that difference is due to whatever method of articulation is being used to create the sound. Blowing, plucking, bowing, buzzing, and striking excite vibrating bodies in different ways to initiate these sounds. But if you get rid of the attacks of each instrument, the sustaining tones have their own harmonic information, something which is commonly called timbre. In short, Comparing different instruments' sustaining tones will show you that certain pitches, aside from the fundamental, have more energy than others and make an instrument sound like the instrument. Sound familiar? Here's a list of instruments with pretty unique spectra. I couldn't pick a standard ensemble like a string quartet because those instruments have two similar overtone distributions. They sound too similar. This list is great. This ensemble will probably sound pretty bad because these sounds have a tough time blending together. And that's kind of the point. And yes, using instruments with different stops is kind of cheating, but you try to find an instrument that has a strong f***ing eighth partial. And I know what you're thinking, but we're leaving extended techniques like multiphonics and natural harmonics out of this for simplicity. So, if we take our list of formants and simplify it slightly by combining vowels that sound very similar, along with our list of instruments, we can start to make connections. Each syllable has a corresponding instrument which vaguely matches its spectral qualities. Diphthongs will be treated as doublings, and any vowel outside of our list, like e, will be played by the tuba, just because. Now, we need to take a look at the front consonants. Each consonant has a method and location of articulation, and can either be voiced or unvoiced. For example, if you're making a long sound with your throat, not your nose, where your tongue touches your teeth, that causes vibrations in your throat, that's a voiced dental fricative, or the sound you make when you say words like these and there. One of the exciting and infuriating parts about written English is that there's often no distinction between these two sounds, which is what makes this happen. Even when it's supposed to be voiced, there's no way for people who don't know IPA to know whether or not you're supposed to voice the TH, you just gotta know. The labial dental fricatives have different letters, but these don't. Anyway, we're going to treat these like you'd expect. Plosives and taps, since they're short, will correspond to staccati. Fricatives and nasals, which can be as long as you want, will be tenuti. Voiced consonants will be accents by the merit of adding more energy into the consonant, ergo making it louder. Unvoiced consonants will not be accented. There's not really a D accent symbol in written music, but trust me, it's there. The trickiest part is going to be the location of articulation. There are so many of these that it won't be possible to place this on a binary like we did with the other factors. Just look at how many ways there are to say N, all based on the posture and location of your tongue. The two other musical parameters that we can correspond to something gradated are dynamics and brightness. We're not going to touch dynamics since we want all of these notes to be as close to the same loudness as possible, so that leaves us with brightness. Every instrument above has some method of controlling the brightness of their pitch. The wind instruments have embouchure and alternate fingerings. The plucked strings have proximity to the bridge and palm muting. And the bowed strings have soltasto and sol ponticello. The two keyboard instruments have additional stops so that whenever they want a brighter or darker note, they can just push a button. If there's a consonant preceding a diphthong, the color change will apply to both instruments. And if there are two beginning consonants preceding a vowel, like Svin, Sming, or Drew, I'll take the relativistic average of the two. Interestingly, in cases like this, the two consonants' locations of articulation never seem to be that far away from each other. Think about how hard it is to say a word with a pair of consonants with really distant location of articulation, like Kvas. Those consonants are often separated with a vowel, like in Gefilte, or we just don't say one of those consonants anymore, like Mnemonic. So, the closer the location of articulation in a given consonant is to the front of your mouth, the brighter that sound will be, and so will its corresponding instrumental equivalent. We're almost there. All we gotta tackle now is the ending consonants. Luckily, most syllables in this performance don't have an ending consonant, but the ones that do are special. I'm talking about the gooch, the fooch, the sheeb, the batzt. These, along with the diphthongs, are the sounds that make Lauren Benedict unique. This means that we gotta find a corresponding musical parameter with all of these sounds. And to be clear, I'm not treating every ending consonant as an ending sound. The R's are just retro flexed, meaning that they change the location of the tongue tip inside the mouth for their preceding vowels, usually darkening it. The H's are just there as vowel modifiers because I was too lazy to use IPA in my transcription. So what meaningful changes can we make to each note based on these ending consonants? To be honest, not much. There aren't any obvious musical parameters that we can change with each note to reflect any sort of pattern present in these ending consonants. Though, a pattern that you do see are that these ending consonants tend to fall on longer notes, and with good reason. It's difficult to spit these out when you're scatting in 16th notes or faster, but when they are used in fast sections, they cleverly precede a syllable with its first consonant in the same location of articulation. It's much harder to say something like fooch sheep quickly. 
So if we know that these ending consonants tend to fall on longer notes because of their difficulty and, anecdotally, that they fall on lots of downbeats, we can treat them as good places to inject the harmony. If you noticed, the transcription has basic chord symbols written even though there isn't an accompaniment part in this performance. The only way I know that these are the chords is because he's singing a jazz standard with a widely available chart. He even sings it in the original key of F major. Let's use these ending consonants as places where you hear, just for a brief moment, the harmony underlying Lauren's performance. I know the reasoning is tenuous, but I think it'll sound cool. Finally, we have a way to translate each scat syllable into orchestrational instructions. Let's take the first note, which is C sharp on the syllable lie. From the L, we know that it's a voiced alveolar fricative, so it'll be stressed and accented and pretty bright. We have a diphthong, an A vowel, and an I vowel, so we know that this will be doubled by shakuhachi and viola. I'll ask the shakuhachi to play bright using its embouchure, and the viola will play poco sul ponticello. There's no ending consonant, so we don't have to worry about that part. Right away, we can see the merits of using such a system. An intense amount of information was coded into just lie that includes pitch, instrumentation, articulation, length, and even brightness. Imagine being able to compose and orchestrate with this kind of efficiency. Imagine taking two seconds to record a voice memo like this to send to some poor underpaid grad student who turns it into a fully realized pointless concerto for orchestra with almost no time spent on your part. Prokofiev did it, why can't you? The downside is, if you're the sucker on the receiving end of this new millennium orchestrational shorthand, like me right now making this video, it's going to take a long, long time to write all this out. Not only are you writing dots on a page rather than melodic lines, you're doing it while cross-referencing a customizable instrument slash phoneme list, an IPA consonant table, your notation software, the voice memo, and most likely the bottle of cheap liquor you're pounding just to get through it all. The upside is, you finally get to hear it. Okay, yes, it sounds really bad, but keep in mind, Lauren Benedict didn't even know he was sending me instructions on how to orchestrate this for an ensemble of two guitars, a shakuhachi, a viola, etc, etc. And you can still hear the tune. This is about the principle, the idea, the innovation. You can mumble something resembling a melody into your phone and arm yourself with a wealth of musical information. Think about how this might change the future of music making. Hans Zimmer can write a film score even faster now. The assistants at his music studio can make more money as hourly employees and all music in the future will sound like this. We aren't going to lose to automation, we are the automation. And you know, this guy is a physicist, which makes me think that he couldn't be entirely unhappy with me connecting some aspects 
aspects of his performance practice with spectral analysis and format frequencies, ignoring how scientifically unsound this whole thing was, and he studied with Steve Coleman. So it's probably not a problem that this ended up sounding so avant-garde. What I'm trying to say is, you should probably listen to this guy. He is an incredible musician, and this is just my little tribute to him. I'm not a jazz musician, so I certainly can't do something like this. But I can make bizarre, unnecessarily complex Klangfarben total serialism with my big brain ivory tower composition degrees. I want to make more music-related videos like this in the future. Subscribe if you want to. Bye!